started with a phone call in May, the day after the Alabama Human Life Protection passed the legislature. I saw an international number coming in on my phone. Lo and behold, it was the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company in London. They wanted to discuss this irrational thing we had just done, passed an abortion bill that allows no exceptions. Well, let me tell you, I was pumped. I was ready to talk about how our bill would save the lives of potentially millions of babies. Well, the next day, I received a phone call from Good Morning Britain, like our Good Morning America. They'd heard that BBC interview and they wanted me to come on their TV show and um, talk about the new abortion law. Again, I quickly agreed. Now, you have to understand the infamous Pierce Morgan is the host. He's also pro-abortion and he could not believe how we would be so horrible to pass a hateful backwards law and he proceeded to call us in Alabama medieval. It was a heated exchange. I tried to keep my friendly Southern charm intact while I refused to back down on my defense of our bill. But he was just furious on how we could be so cruel. And I'm thinking, cruel? By allowing humans the right to be born? Well, not long after that, I did an interview with a Swedish TV station like the BBC, but for Sweden. And then I went, did an interview with the Germans on their version of NPR. You see, abortion became legal in Europe about the same time as it did here. However, there's never really been any pushback or trying to repeal those laws. Abortion is just an accepted normal practice in Europe and other parts of the world. Well, attitudes are shifting. And since Alabama's law was passed and along, along with some other real strict pro-abortion, pro-life bills this year, we are seeing an uptick in pro-life marches across Europe. They are increasing thoughtful debates, and we are seeing their grassroots movement rapidly growing. So I would not have known any of this had I not had the opportunity to go on and be, you know, do these interviews. And this is really exciting news, and I hope that you will carry this forward and tell people about the good things that are happening across, across the world. Um, but today I want to talk to you about the Alabama Human Life Protection Act and why it's so important. I want to focus on a few areas. The first one is the importance of the timing of our bill. The second thing is how our bill is different from other bills across the country. <laughs> and then thirdly, I want to help you think through some arguments that you're going to hear. So let's start with the timing of the bill. One of the questions I was asked in my foreign interviews was, why now? Why hasn't a bill like this, a bill that's a direct challenge to Roe v. Wade, why didn't it come up 20 or 30 years ago? And there are about six main reasons why 2019 made this to be the perfect time to introduce this bill. Well, the first thing is the Supreme Court. In the past, the makeup of the Supreme Court was not favorable for a bill like ours. But with Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, we are closer than we have been in a long time. It's not a slam dunk yet, but we are definitely closer than we were before. The second thing is the 11th Circuit Court. So when we pass an abortion bill in Alabama, it almost always gets challenged. And it ends up in the 11th Circuit Court, which is in Atlanta. And this is the court where it goes to before it goes to the Supreme Court. Well, we have indications from decisions um, that have been made in that court that their views towards Roe v. Wade are changing and that the time is coming to review that decision. Now, the third thing is our medical technology. It's light years ahead of where it was in 1973. We know that babies, even in the first trimester, can feel pain. We see their humanness on ultrasounds like we've never seen before. So that is definitely on our side. The fourth and fifth things have kind of taken place in Alabama specifically. The first is that we have a pro-life attorney general and he will be the one defending this law and he's gonna do a great job when it comes to that. The second thing is in November of last year, Alabamians overwhelmingly passed a constitutional amendment that says this, and we recognize and support the sanctity of life and the rights of unborn children and that no provisions in our constitution provide a right for abortion or require funding for abortions. So we have the Alabama citizens on our side as well. Now here's the sixth thing. It's kind of like happenstance, I guess, but in the beginning of 2019, we really saw a nationwide 
public opinion begin to swing to be more pro-life. And one of those reasons is because of the movie Unplanned about Abby Johnston's life um, as a Planned Parenthood director. And according to several news stories, and I actually heard her on a conference call, hundreds, more than 200 abortion workers have left the industry because of her story. Now, right around that same time as the movie was coming out, we had new laws in New York and Virginia um, <laughs> that basically allowed for infanticide. And this caused a public outcry in large numbers, even from former pro-choice people. Um, so all of these things have kind of added up that 2019 is the year for us to do this. So let's look at how our bill is different from other bills across the country. Our law was drafted specifically to challenge Roe v. Wade, like, like no laws have done before. Previous laws have kind of chipped away at abortion a little bit at a time. You'd have where you, you couldn't abort after 25 weeks, and then it became 20 weeks, and then 15 weeks, and, and then as soon as it ha has a heartbeat. Um, so moving those gestation dates has, has definitely helped reduce the number. Some of the laws um, tried to make it harder to get abortion. You had to have parental <laughs> consent or waiting periods. Some laws tried to ed uh, regulate the clinics. And some laws tried to outlaw the way we do abortions, like, for example, you couldn't do dismemberment abortions. Well, all of these laws have helped reduce the number of abortions, and we're thankful for all of those, but we've never really had a law that was written specifically and expressly to challenge Roe v. Wade. So along comes Alabama's Human Life Protection Act. Some people call our law the harshest on the books, but we like to say it is the proper legal vehicle to challenge Roe v. Wade. Our law is different in how it defines a person. It defines a person the same way as our homicide code does. So our, co our code talks about an unborn child being one in utero. So if it's gonna be a crime to kill the baby in the womb, it needed to be defined just like our homicide code. Now, in, in utero is a really important term, and it's the difference between a lot of bills that you hear that talk about life at conception. If you're like me, you believe that, that life does begin at conception. That is when the egg is fertilized. Life is there, there's new DNA. But you know what? You cannot prove exactly when that happens. But you can prove it a different way. In utero, the word we use in, in utero means when the fertilized egg is actually implanted into the wall of the uterus. That can be proven because the HCG is, the hormone is now picked up in the blood and it's detectable so that we know we have tangible proof that there's life. So those words in utero are used in our bill as well. Since our objective was to challenge Roe v. Wade, we needed to make sure that our case was as provable as possible, and that term does that. Now, probably the most significant way that our bill is different is that we could not have any exceptions for abortion, even in the case of rape and incest. And this is what caused the national news media to descend on our state. Americans all across the country watched the angry legislators in Alabama yell and scream and even cry racism for not allowing exceptions. I'll tell you, it was very ugly as I watched from the gallery above, and I couldn't help think to myself over and over, you are watching history. I just kept imagining and trying to cement this in my mind because I think this is the beginning. It's been beginning, but this, this bill right here is going to have a huge impact. Now, we had to remove the exceptions, though, since we're trying to establish that the baby in utero is a real person and you can't kill it. You can't have an exception where you say, well, okay, if it came by rape or incest, then it's not really a person and you can kill it. You can't argue both sides, so we had to remove that. And guys, no matter how it got there, it really is a person. During several of my interviews, the reporters complained that this law would make the mother the criminal and that she would go to jail for an abortion. 
but they obviously hadn't read the bill. Maybe this is where the get in your face thing comes. I had to <laughs> correct them on this. Um, our law specifically states that the mother will not be prosecuted in any way. However, the doctor who performs the abortion will, and, and he's caught, he will be slapped with a class A felony, which is the most serious type of crime. Yeah. A doctor who attempts an abortion and is caught gets a, a class C felony. Um, those are the biggest differences between our bill and the other bills that passed. And I'm sure you would agree with me that the abortion issue is not going away anytime soon. So, which is a good, I mean, let's keep the conversation going. So one of the things I thought might be helpful is to walk you through some of the most common arguments that you may hear. Now, my goal is to better equip you as you defend the pro-life position. Um, first of all, most of the debating that I have done on abortion is with the left or with non-Christians. So when I'm doing that, I stay away from the moral arguments. They don't believe in the Bible. When you use it to make your points, it just falls on deaf ears, makes them mad. So with those people, I just try to use science. Uh, and, and evidence, and it works. Um, so know your audience, of course, um, by all means. If you're talking with someone who does have a moral background and believes in the Bible, of course use that. That's the reason that we're fighting for life in the first place, but there are some that that doesn't work. So just know your audience. Um, and rest assured that science and evidence are on our side. Um, so let's take the most common one first. It's the argument that pulls on everyone's heartstrings. It's rape and incest. Many people, even Christians, feel that it's compassionate to allow a woman to abort a baby if it's conceived in rape. But I wanna share some facts with you that you may not know. First of all, it's important to recognize that rape and incest account for less than 1% of abortions, okay? Less than 1%. Yet this is the argument that I hear the most. So I like to ask these people, you know, if this is really the reason you want to have abortion, you know, you want abortions to be legal, then you'll join me to stop the other 99%, right? Well, you figure out real quickly, they don't want to stop abortion, um, but they will use this argument to exploit this tiny fraction and these victims as their excuse to keep those abortion clinics open. Um, but it's true, right? We are led to believe that everyone who is conceived in rape wants an abortion, right? I mean, they kind of tell us this. Um, but the largest study that was ever done on pregnant rape victims, it was done by Dr. Sandra Maycorn. She found that 75 to 85% of victims chose against abortion and chose to carry their babies. Um, but the women's rights folks, the pro-abortion people, they want you to believe that the rape victims overwhelmingly want to terminate their pregnancies, but they don't. The opposite is true. Now, as you can imagine, there is horrible, and I hope none of us have ever had to go through this or will have to go through this in the future, but there's horrible trauma involved in rape. The woman is attacked, she's violated against her will, her life is changed forever. But it's also true that deep scars are left after having an abortion. For some, the trauma may not show up for decades, but for most, the remorse, the guilt, the depression are felt immediately. So think about this. The blame of the rape is on the rapist. He's the one that did it. He's the one that violated it. It's his fault. She's innocent. But the blame of the abortion is on the mother. And she has now been hurt once, she's gonna make a decision that's gonna affect her, so she has compounded trauma. Now, Dr. Reardon has also done research on this in his book, and he shows that rape victims who abort have a four times higher chance of dying within one year of that abortion than those who choose life. They also have higher suicide rates, murder rates, drug overdose, depression, addiction, and more. Now here's something really important for this argument, so pay close attention. Rapists love abortion. I'll say it again. Rapists love abortion. It destroys the evidence of their crime. They can violate woman after woman knowing 
that the evidence will be erased at an abortion clinic. That DNA connecting to them to the crime will vanish. Think of the human trafficker. They don't want their girls to be pregnant. That hurts their profits. We've heard of multiple stories of Planned Parenthood not reporting underage, very young um, victims of rape. Well, guess what? It hurts their profit too. They are siding with the rapists rather than the victims. So let's talk about that 12-year-old girl who is raped by a family member. This is what they brought up in the Alabama argument is they kept talking about this 11 or 12 year old. What if 11 or 12 year old girl is raped? That's horrible, that's horrible. We're, I think everyone in this room, of course we're compassionate towards that young girl that should have never happened. Um, but when she aborts that baby, that crime is covered up. And most likely she will continue to be violated and abused by that family member. The bad guy's safe. His ev the evidence is gone. So what if that girl were to carry that baby to term, then adopt the family, you know, the baby out to a family? That man who violated her will have a better chance of being prosecuted because the evidence is in the DNA. Again, we know from research that that young girl's chances of suicide, drug use, addiction, etc., will be higher if she aborts. So think about it this way, and I love to think about it this way. The baby can actually be the one who delivers the victim out of an abusive situation. That's a great way to, to think about that baby. Even if she adopts it out, it was the baby that is removing her from that abuse, abusive situation. In Alabama, we have over 70 crisis pregnancy centers um, and those types of things that can help young women in these situations. I'm sure your states have them as well. Um, but if we're going to be part of the you know, ending abortion, then let's be part of the solution and help women that are in situations like these. So I just encourage you to send money, volunteer with these crisis pregnancy centers because we need to be a help to them. Now, another common argument I get is it's just a blob of tissue. We've all heard that. Uh, 43 years ago, that's what a lot of people believed, but science is undeniable, it's on our side, and it backs up the Bible. Look at any respected book on embryology, and it will state that there is a completely new and separate individual forms when the egg is fertilized. Think about this. In just 12 short weeks, the baby's about the size of a peach. It's almost it's fully formed. It's kicking, stretching, even hiccuping. His reflexes have kicked in, and his little fingers and toes, he'll be, be able to open and close. His toes will curl. His mouth will make sucking movements. While all this is going on, the mother doesn't even, she can't feel a thing. Guys, this is just at 12 weeks. It already looks like a baby. All its internal organs are formed. It's still tiny, but they're formed. The baby is not a blob of tissue. The baby is a miraculous gift from God. This answer also applies when they say, it's my body. Science shows the baby growing inside is a completely distinct new individual. It's not her body. It's, it's a new body. How about this argument? We have so many kids in foster care. They use this in Alabama a lot. We have so many kids in foster care, we can't even get them adopted. So how are we going to take these unwanted children if they outlaw abortions. And this one was thrown at me actually from a, a foreign interview. But my response was this, that only a small percentage of children in foster care are actually adoptable. The vast majority of kids in foster care are removed from the home till their parents get their act together and then they're placed back in the home or in, with a loving family member. Americans and Alabamians, we are desperate to adopt. We leave the country um, to find babies to adopt, and I'm sure you know people like this. Um, but those are the most common arguments that I get. As I wrap, wrap up my talk, I want to discuss to you that of all the issues we face in this country, whether it's socialism, open borders, national security, education, taxes, health care, they all pale in comparison to protecting life. These tiny babies are eternal beings. We will see them in heaven one day. But for the unborn here on earth in the womb, they're defenseless. They have no ability to protect themselves. 
In some areas in America, there are more babies that are aborted than are born. The protection of these defenseless children rests on you and me and others like us. As you know, our society is coming hard after life. They're coming hard. They're coming against God and his people. But God warned us in these days that these days would come and we would be hated for his namesake. So let's be bolder than ever and stand up for life because God says, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed because I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. He is with us. So go out and speak the truth boldly because this is our time. <laughs>